I've been playing Alliance Alive because you have no time to gain. <laughs> So, if we go back to the early 80s, games called Ultima and Wizardry existed, which in many ways are the reasons JRPGs exist, as many of the early JRPG devs cite these games as their inspiration. Even in modern days, these games still provide inspiration, and one such inspired person is Masataka Matsura of the Japanese company Fu Ryu. This gentleman was behind a little 3DS game called The Legend of Legacy that, in, in my unprofessional opinion, takes more inspiration from the Saga series of games with their batshit insane levelling mechanics than it does from Ultima or Wizardry. Now, The Legend of Legacy was not the most well-received game ever, but this didn't dampen Matsura's enthusiasm, so he and his team went out to refine what they'd previously created grabbing Yoshitaka Muriyama of Suikoden fame to be the scenario writer, as they wanted to replicate the story feel of those 90s JRPGs. So I played it on Nintendo Switch. This is the HD remaster version of the 3DS original. It took me about 28 hours to see the end credits, maybe a bit more as I lost some progress thanks to Little One turning off the game before I could save it. Um, the game was originally released in 2017 in Japan and 2018 worldwide for 3DS. With the remaster, the preferred way to play the game, I would say, was released in 2019 on PS4, Switch and later PC. So, did the game reach Matsura's goals, I hear you gesticulate? On to the story. In the ye old times, there was a war. A war that humanity lost a war against the now overlords of the world, the demons. To help subjugate and suppress the war like humans, and teach them the virtues of law and order, they used powerful magic to divide the world into four areas, and task the beastmen race to watch over and manage the unruly humans. It's roughly a thousand years later, and we take on the role of a mixed band of misfits, the titular alliance, starting with Galil and Azura, members of a rebel group, along with buddies Renzo and Barbarossa, one of the aforementioned beastmen, I believe a snake type creature, lizard thing. Um, they fight against the demon regime, but it's not long before events conspire to bring together more people into their group. There are even some, there are even some hidden missable characters. The other members include misfit demons, who are actually a noble's daughter, Vivian, and her butler, Ignance, or Ignacy, or however you want to say it, that just seem to find humans interesting. The human demon collaborator, Gene, and his mercenary buddy, uh, Rachel, and the tech genius, Tiggy, another human. So we get quite the varied cast with many different motivations, and they come from all over the different areas of the world and beyond. This group soon learns of a greater conspiracy than just fighting back against the demons. A conspiracy around the dark current that was used to divide the world. They must work together to bring it down and stop whatever machinations are happening. So how does it play? Well, it's a stereotypical turn-based battle system with menus, skills, etc. But in the HD remaster, it's quite zippy as they've added a speed up function up to four times speed and even an auto battle feature, but be careful using that. It does have some twists though, such as the formation system that you can alter mid battle by rearranging characters between guard, offense and support roles, also with a front, mid and back positioning. So you can be a guard at the front or at the back row, depending on how you want to do it. Um, it allows for some flexibility in playstyles and character usage, of which you get five in a battle out of the however many you have in your team. This leads on to the leveling system. I say leveling. Uh, so as I stated, Legend of Legacy was saga based, and so is this saga inspired. So the inspiration in this game comes in the form of you don't have levels as such. Each character has set base stats such as HP, SP, attack, etc. 
and in each battle you have a random chance of increasing the stats but only HP and SP, SP being skill points. Now the way you see actual growth is based on the weapons you have equipped as each time you attack you have a chance to unlock a new skill for said weapon along with, with the chance of upgrading that particular skill in the position your character is in. So an example being if you use an attack skill while you're in the attack position in your formation, it has a chance of raising that skill's attack buff. So each skill has like a set value for either attack, guard or support. And these raise as you use them in that position. My God, that's kind of confusing to explain. It does make sense eventually. Also, don't forget to upgrade your equipment. Um, the equipment is kind of your other area of stat buffs, better equipment, better skills, uh, better stats. While this all feels a little bit random because it's your HP and SP go up randomly, you acquire skills randomly, you, you, your skills level up randomly. They did include a method of controlling your character a bit in the form of talents. So after battles, you can acquire TP, which is your talent points, and these can be spent on talents that give buffs for, say, a certain weapon type, um, or there's like more generic ones like reducing prices in shops, uh, making you harder to spot. So you can focus your character on a specific weapon type, and you can use uh, unlock talents such as reducing the cost of the skills, so reducing the SP they need, uh, making it stronger in certain positions, etc. So you have some control over how your character builds and there are also talents that allow you a better chance of unlocking skills for particular weapons. The next big feature is the guilds. After a short while you'll unlock this feature in which you can recruit random people from around the world and these can be sent to a specific guild. They usually have a lot of choice of between three and you can allocate them to which one you want and each guild offers different benefits um, such as the Signomancy Guild giving you new Signomancy spells, the blacksmiths unlocking new items, etc. You can also set guild towers on the map at specific points. These provide special effects in battle when you're in range of the tower. So it's a bit of a management game of how you want to cover your team, where you want the guild towers, where you think they'll be most effective, which towers you feel are most effective in what area. But it is a finite resource and there's only so many potential recruits. So you can't max out every tower. So it's ideal to focus on maybe one tower and then focus on the next ones later. Um, and on like navigation of the world, I always like to talk about this in JRPGs. We get a few different vehicles to make it get around easier. First one is the Ornithopter, or however you say it, which is like a set of wings that allow you to glide from higher positions. So you slowly descend using it, but you can get from like a high position to a slightly lower position that you wouldn't be able to reach, say, without jumping off first. Then you'll eventually unlock a boat. And um, this is the main vehicle of the game. And it's not long until you get it actually into the game. The, you get to even name the boat yourself and it has all of the towers built onto it. So you have this mobile station which can buff you. Um, it also gets upgraded later and the upgrade is pretty good. So in, in the boat as well, there there's like a save point, rest station, and because you have the guild towers, you have access to shops. There's also a couple of animal based vehicles in quotation marks, but I don't want to spoil them as they're pretty cool. This is all wrapped up in quite an interesting art style. The world has a very watercolour feel to it, uh, but it does have like a chibi aesthetic with the characters and such. And no word of a lie, the world is actually pretty good. Like the towns have interesting bits and pieces, interesting people to talk to, and are varied in design. The dungeons are pretty simple though, but they don't overstay their welcome, and there's a bit of variety in them as well. But the world map is honestly the best bit of the design it's multi-leveled varied lots of hidden bits and pieces 
it's just an interesting design overall. So yeah, what is actually good about the game? Honestly, as I've just said, the design of the world map is fantastic. So many games now that actually have a world map are just flat. Like you have mountains that block you and, or various bits of like terrain are just used to block you, but it's flat. But this one has so much verticality to it, which gives you so many options to take advantage of it. And like this opens up the use of the different vehicles that you get or, or animals for interesting ways. Well, it does kind of have the generic biomes that you're used to, like a fireplace, an ice place, etc. There are a couple of other ones that do really stand out, but it'd be spoilers to say what they are. They, they are quite visually appealing places on the world map. Um, along with this, it has a pretty solid battle system that offers quite a bit of variety in playstyles. You can build the characters in ways that you want, even if it is very random. You, if you work on it, you can build them to be what you want. If you want someone to be a shield person, you can do it. If you want someone to be an axe person, you can do it. If you want someone to be like a mage, you can do it. The other bit that's actually pretty good is the story. Because you're playing this mixed group that all have very different experiences. It makes for quite a varied cast. And there's quite a focus on themes like racism that's rampant throughout the world. So like the area that Galil and Azura and friends are in, they're heavily oppressed by the beastmen and they're seen as lesser beings. And when we meet Vivian and Ignacy or Ignance, um, they, while well, Vivian not so much, Ignance has the view that humans are lesser creatures, but they slowly learn that this is not necessarily the case. So it has this look at racism, but it doesn't go so deep into it that it muddies the experience and but it's not done in a very inconsequential way that a lot of other games have where it's just kind of there but not looked at um the game doesn't shy away from the ideas of such as loss um and actually has some pretty dark moments in it as well which caught me off guard i wasn't expecting it from the art style but let's stop being nice to it now what, what's actually bad in the game well, in this case, I personally struggled somewhat with the art style, specifically the character models. I like the watercolours, but the character models has that 3DS JRPG art style with the chibi characters, etc. I know it's originally a 3DS game, and that was kind of what was in vogue for 3DS, but it actually quite jars heavily with the tone of the story and knocks some of the edge off some of the more serious scenes when you're having something kind of grim and dark going down and it's just this chibi character and there's no like not at the risk of sounding edgy there's no like violent like blood or gore to it it's um could have had it so if we had a look at other 3ds games you had like smt4 like shin megami tensei 4 if it had more of that visual art style i think this game would have benefited a lot from it um, and on like the gameplay side i personally feel that the star like the saga style character development could really be a pull off for a lot of people as it feels a little bit out of control um, and a lot of people i know like to be able to control how their characters develop a bit more but the devs have done what they can to balance this um so it's a it, i think that's more of a personal you don't like the saga games from the past then you probably won't enjoy this if you do you may well enjoy this um speaking of balance oh yeah what a segue there is one point in the game that has killed the entire experience for people like looking online i've noticed a lot of people have just given up at this point it's a single boss and it's one of the most unbalanced video game bosses in history it required like me to completely change how I was playing the game to that point, which required a lot of grinding to rebuild characters in a different way, just specifically to beat this boss. And it's not even like an end game boss where you can think, oh, I'm right at the end of the game. No, this was, this was like halfway through the game and it just came out of nowhere. There was no hint that this boss was gonna be the nightmare that it was. 
and I don't understand why they didn't adjust it for the HD remaster. They could have adjusted it, made it a bit better, and made the experience a little bit smoother for everyone. There are also some UI elements that could have had a bit of work around item management. Like you can order your items, but on the equip screen, they don't show up as ordered, sort of. Um, skills also, because they load randomly, tend to be like jumbled up in your skills menu. It'd be nice to like reorder them based on like their attack ability. But these are these are little nitpicks if really. If there was a way to adjust like the layout of it, I couldn't see it, but I'm a bit of a dumbass, so maybe it just, it just wasn't obvious to me. Um and f then we have the voice acting. Or well, you know, the distinct lack of it. This is super jarring in the animated cutscenes where you can see people's mouth flaps are flapping but there's no sound just subtitles it really feels like it was just not put in like forgotten it's a really odd design choice and I understand again it was a 3DS game but for the HD remasters maybe they could have added voices I don't know maybe they didn't think the game it was worth it because of the kind of niche elements of the game oh oh and the absolute worst thing for me, other than say the boss, so many enemies on the map are faster than you, because this isn't a random encounter game, it's a one of those games where the enemy is on the map and you kind of run into them or they run to you. And they're faster than you. It's, I can get this for one or two enemies, or like when you have like set unavoidable battles for story reasons, etc. But in this, so many of the enemies are just faster than you are. And at which point, I'm just like, just make it random encounters. It's more frustrating when they're faster than you, and you have no way of avoiding it. In it, this, the whole point of having the enemies on the map, I felt in games was so you could avoid battles better and easier, and weren't getting bogged down with random encounters. It, you may as well, if you're going to make them all faster than you, just have random encounters. It was frustrating. And it's possibly the worst example of on-map enemies I've seen implemented in a game to date. It just makes navigating the map on foot a serious chore. And I stopped going into certain type of random dungeon in the game because I couldn't be bothered with it. And it if those had been random encounters, I'd have just done it. But because it wasn't, no, no, it annoyed me. So, as always, we have a quick look at what the critics thought as well. So first up, Nintendo Life. They said, it's a well-written story, a smartly interwoven and complex system of gameplay mechanics, and a distinctive visual style that makes it a no-brainer for anybody looking for a consistently high-quality RPG experience on the Switch. Nintendo Life really enjoyed this. They actually rated it nine out of 10. This is some seriously high praise. And while I do mostly agree with them on the story, the rest of it's a bit overinflated in my opinion. It, it's obviously the reviewer, this was the game for them, but I don't think the game is for everyone. So we have the sixth axis, on the other hand, if a classic JRPG is what you're looking for, the Alliance Live HD delivers most of what you could want, if little else. This is kind of more in line with what I feel. It does have that classic RPG, specifically Starga, kind of fantasy sci-fi-ish plot, touching on some dark undertones and convoluted character progression. Yeah kind of feels like a classic JRPG in some sense. Now, my personal opinion is the game is so close. I vaguely remember Legend of Legacy and dropping it quite early on, but this game did inspire me to continue to the end if some of the roadblocks really tried my patience. So the upgrades and the desire to improve that the devs were aiming for worked to some extent. And uh, like I've actually said, I quite enjoy the story, but it does feel like it needs a second game as there are hints to a much larger universe out there and maybe some more refinement, uh, like a, an Alliance of Life 2 could be a real classic. It does ask some interesting questions as well. So at what point is law and order just oppression? Is it possible to control the inherent chaos in humanity's nature? And can people overcome their differences and racial biases and come together? These are all interesting themes, and it touches on them, but a second game could go a bit deeper into them. The 
the actual gameplay was quite interesting. I'm not going to lie, I used the auto setting a lot up until the final battles and even somewhat in the final boss. The only time I didn't was when I really needed to heal, as the auto just uses the heal on the cast and character. But the game kind of left me feel like I was missing something. Like I possibly didn't quite understand everything that was on offer, or I didn't build the characters as well as I could have because of the random nature and the egregious difficulty spike mid-game. It just didn't quite click. It's a JRPG that's very much rooted in the past, and as such, I couldn't recommend it to everyone. But I do feel like if you know what you're getting into, you can find something you can enjoy. So my rating overall is it's for niche fans only.